Lurking behind the silver screen is a world rife with drama not scripted for the movies, a world where friendships are formed in the spotlight and shattered in the shadows. From trusted confidants to bitter rivals, we delve into Hollywood's most shocking betrayals. These are the stories of friends turned enemies, where a single act of deceit can turn a red carpet ally into a backstage foe. It's not just drama, it's real life with real consequences. This is Hollywood's hidden battleground, Abbott and Lou Costello. When they met, it was clear that the duo were comedic geniuses. They knew for a fact that if they teamed up, they would be unstoppable, but little did they know that their love of money would cause a fight that would eventually break them apart. Abbott and Costello's story started when they crossed paths in the 1930s. Bud Abbott, the straight man with a quick wit, and Lou Costello, the goofy and lovable funny man, teamed up to create magic. Their chemistry was electric, leading to a partnership that made audiences everywhere burst into laughter. They instantly became friends and in 1940s and 50s, Abbott and Costello took the comedy world by storm, making films and performing routines that are still remembered today. But, as with many friendships, cracks begin to show. It was rumored that the root of their feud lay in financial troubles and disagreements over contracts. Despite bringing joy to millions, behind the scenes money became a sore point. Abbott felt he deserved a bigger share of the earnings while Costello believed they should split everything equally. Costello was disappointed that his partner was asking for higher pay as this implied that he didn't deserve to be paid as much as he did. The tension grew, leading to a legal battle. These two talented comedians who were once inseparable couldn't even stand each other anymore and eventually their professional partnership came to an end in 1956. Debbie Reynolds and Elizabeth Taylor You would agree that every woman's fear is having a friend who is not loyal, one who will go as far as seducing and snatching her husband from her. Well, this was exactly what happened to Debbie Reynolds. Being friends with Elizabeth Taylor made her greatest fear come to pass. Back in the 1950s, young and vibrant Debbie Reynolds, a rising star, crossed paths with Elizabeth Taylor, who was already a seasoned actress at MGM Studios. Despite their differences, they clicked like magic, forging a friendship that seemed unbreakable. As Reynolds' star ascended along City Taylor's, their bond grew stronger. In 1955, Reynolds married the charming actor and singer Eddie Fisher. Their love story started during the Korean War, performing for American troops. A beautiful family blossomed with the arrival of their daughter, Carrie Fisher. Meanwhile, Elizabeth Taylor, always one to make headlines, tied the knot for the third time with Reynolds as her maid of honor and Eddie as the best man. Tragedy struck on March 23, 1958, when Taylor's husband, Mike Todd, perished in a plane crash. Little did anyone know that this event would cast a shadow over the once unbreakable friendship. Grieving, Taylor leaned on Reynolds' husband, Eddie, for support. Reynolds, in a generous act, sent him to comfort her grieving friend. However, within two weeks of Todd's death, Hollywood was shaken by one of its biggest scandals. Eddie Fisher divorced Debbie Reynolds, leaving her with two kids and promptly married Elizabeth Taylor on the same day. What was meant to be comfort turned into one of the most infamous betrayals in Hollywood history. Left to raise her children alone, Debbie Reynolds was devastated by the betrayal of her soul sister, who had seemingly walked away with her man as if their shared history meant nothing. Elizabeth Taylor, in defense, claimed Reynolds' marriage was already on the rocks, but the damage was done. The story of Debbie Reynolds and Elizabeth Taylor's friendship made it clear that sometimes the enemy within can be more devastating than any external foe. Marlon Brando and Frank Sinatra In the old Hollywood days, imagine if common sense could speak, it would probably say, stay away from the wild drama between Marlon Brando and Frank Sinatra. The two may have started off as friends, but their friendship soon turned into something toxic and unbearable. Things got so bad that one of them was later allegedly kidnapped as a result of their feud. Frank Sinatra and Brando worked together on a musical called Guys and Dolls in 1955, and it was a real headache for the person in charge. Sinatra got really mad because he was supposed to be the main guy, but they gave that part to Brando. Sinatra was sure he deserved it more. 
As they worked on the musical, things got worse between Brando and Sinatra. They went from name-calling to causing trouble during scenes. But then the drama got even crazier when Sinatra's personal life got mixed up in everything. Marlon, who was known for being charming, found himself in hot water when Sinatra's wife started spending time in his dressing room. This led to a wild situation where Sinatra's friends kidnapped Brando. At that point, their fight became a nightmare that you'd wish was just a bad dream. Hollywood sure knows how to cook up some wild stories. Betta Davis and Joan Crawford once upon a time in Hollywood's glamorous golden age, Bette Davis and Joan Crawford were not just leading ladies, they were in fact close friends. Davis with her critical acclaim for nearly a hundred films, and Crawford, a divisive figure in the eyes of some, yet undeniably, an A-list star. In the early days, their friendship seemed destined for the stars. However, the first cracks appeared in 1933, a pivotal year that marked the beginning of a tale more dramatic than any script they ever portrayed. Davis, basking in the glory of a leading role in Ex Lady, envisioned her name gracing front-page news, but fate had other plans. Crawford, with her flair for the dramatic, announced her divorce, stealing the spotlight and relegating Ex Lady to mere shadows in the newspapers. The reviews were scant, and the headlines were dominated by Crawford's personal turmoil. This moment ignited the spark that would fuel a feud lasting an incredible four decades. As the years unfolded, their friendship unraveled into a fierce competition, a relentless race of egos that played out on and off the silver screen. Jabs, both professional and personal, became the currency of their relationship. The Hollywood martyr, as Crawford was portrayed in one account, and the critical darling Davis clashed in a battle where no holds were barred. Through collaborations and intermittent periods of civility, the feud persisted, becoming a captivating chapter in Tinseltown lore. Imagine the intrigue, the whispered conversations, and the behind-the-scenes drama that unfolded between takes. The very essence of their rivalry became woven into the fabric of Hollywood history. Dean Martins and Jerry Lewis. They started off as two friends who were invested in each other's careers, but soon enough their friendship turned into a dark feud. Back in the mid-1940s, Dean Martin was a nightclub singer looking for his big break. Then came Jerry Lewis, a whirlwind of comedic energy, entering Martin's life after a chance meeting at a club in 1946. Their chemistry was undeniable, and by the next year, the dynamic duo of comedy was born. From 1949 to 1956, Lewis and Martin created Magic together, starring in a staggering 16 films that captivated audiences. It seemed like things were going well between them, but behind the scenes, the cracks were forming. Martin, tired of playing the straight man to Lewis's zany antics, wanted a change. Lewis, on the other hand, couldn't tolerate Martin's less intense work style. The breaking point came in 1954 during the promotion of Living It Up when Look magazine cropped Martin out of a photo. The rift deepened, and by 1956, their partnership came to an abrupt end. For 20 long years, the once inseparable friends chose silence over conversation. It was that bad. Not many people know this, but it took the intervention of a mutual friend, Frank Sinatra, to bring them back together on stage in 1976. Despite a civil facade for the cameras, true reconciliation remained elusive until tragedy struck. It was the untimely death of Martin's son in a plane crash in 1987 that finally melted the ice between them. The bitter taste of their split lingered, but it wasn't until 1995, after Martin's passing, that Jerry Lewis publicly shouldered the blame for the decades-long feud. It is clear that their story showcased the complexity of friendships in the spotlight. Clearly, even the brightest partnerships can face stormy weather, and sometimes it takes a lot of time and a lot of heartache to find the way back to the laughter they once shared. When Virginia Hill, the glamorous socialite and rumored mob courier, was found dead in her Austrian home, Hollywood was abuzz with whispers. Hill, who had been romantically linked to stars like Errol Flynn and Joe Adonis, was more than just a pretty face. She was a woman who knew too much, a woman who had navigated the dangerous waters between Hollywood fame and organized crime. Was her death a suicide, as officially reported, or was it something far more sinister? 
Virginia Hill is just one example of the complex web of connections between Hollywood and the mob, a web that we're about to untangle in this video. We'll delve into 10 shocking stories that reveal the hidden alliances, secret deals, and unspeakable acts that have colored the history of the entertainment industry. From the Rat Pack's mob ties to the mysterious circumstances surrounding Marilyn Monroe's death, we're lifting the curtain on Hollywood's darkest secrets. Some of these tales will leave you speechless, others will make you question the very foundation of Hollywood's glittering facade. Get ready for a roller coaster of revelations. In the early 20th century, Hollywood was a land of dreams and opportunities, a place where anyone with talent and ambition could make it big. But behind the glitz and glamour lay a darker world, one that was intricately tied to the rise of organized crime in America. As Hollywood began to flourish, so did the mob, finding in this burgeoning industry a golden opportunity for profit and influence. The mob's involvement in Hollywood can be traced back to the Prohibition era, a time when alcohol was illegal but demand was high. Speakeasies became the social hubs of the era, and who better to run these establishments than organized crime figures? It wasn't long before Hollywood stars, producers, and directors became regular patrons, rubbing shoulders with gangsters and underworld figures. This was the beginning of a symbiotic relationship that would shape Hollywood for decades to come. But the mob's influence wasn't limited to speakeasies. They saw the potential in the film industry itself. Theaters were a lucrative business, and the mob wanted in. They began by gaining control over labor unions, specifically those associated with the projectionists. By controlling the unions, they could control the theaters, and by extension, the films that got shown. This gave them unprecedented influence over Hollywood, allowing them to dictate terms and even influence the content of films. One of the most notorious figures of this era was Willie Beoff, a mobster with close ties to the Chicago outfit. Beoff had his hands in various Hollywood unions and was instrumental in extorting money from the studios. The studios had little choice but to comply and thus a pattern was established. Hollywood would produce the films and the mob would ensure they got the audience they desired for a price. This was the hidden machinery that powered Hollywood's golden age, a machinery lubricated by corruption, extortion and organized crime. While the stars smiled for the cameras and the audiences reveled in the magic of cinema, few were aware of the shadowy figures pulling the strings behind the scenes. And so the stage was set for a complex and often dangerous relationship between Hollywood and the mob, a relationship that would lead to shocking alliances, betrayals, and a web of connections so intricate that it would boggle the mind. But this is just the beginning. Prepare yourself for what comes next will reveal the first of many shocking connections that bind the world of entertainment to the underworld. Frank Sinatra, the iconic crooner known for his velvety voice and timeless hits, was the epitome of Hollywood glamour. But behind the smooth persona lay a man entangled in a web of controversy, a man whose life was as complex as the songs he sang, Sinatra's alleged ties to the mob have been the subject of speculation for decades, and while the full truth may never be known, there's enough evidence to paint a compelling picture. Sinatra's connection to the mob reportedly began in the early stages of his career, a time when he was struggling to make a name for himself. It was the 1940s, and Sinatra was desperate for a break. Enter Skinny D'Amato, a nightclub owner with known ties to the mob. D'Amato took a liking to Sinatra and offered him regular gigs at his club, the 500 Club, in Atlantic City. This was Sinatra's first brush with the underworld, and it would set the stage for a lifetime of murky associations. But it wasn't just about gigs and nightclubs. Sinatra's mob connections allegedly extended to his personal life as well. Rumors swirled about his friendship with Sam Giancana, a notorious Chicago mobster. The two were often seen together, and Sinatra even went as far as to introduce Giancana to John F. Kennedy during the 1960 presidential campaign. This raised eyebrows, to say the least, and led many to question the extent of Sinatra's involvement with organized crime. Then there was the Cal Neva Lodge, 
a casino resort straddling the border between California and Nevada. Sinatra became a part owner of the establishment in 1960, and it wasn't long before it became a hot spot for celebrities and gangsters alike. The Rat Pack performed there, and high-profile guests included the likes of Marilyn Monroe and Dean Martin. But the resort was also frequented by mob figures, and it was rumored that illegal activities, including gambling and money laundering, were taking place behind closed doors. Sinatra's gaming license was eventually revoked, casting a dark shadow over his reputation. Despite the controversies, Sinatra's career continued to soar. He won awards, sold millions of records, and became a Hollywood legend. But the questions remained, casting a long shadow that would follow him to his grave. Was Sinatra merely a pawn in the mob's grander schemes, or was he an active participant in their illicit activities? The lines were blurred, and the truth, it seemed, was as elusive as the man himself. As we peel back the layers of Sinatra's complex life, we're left to ponder the ethical dilemmas that come with such associations. Can talent and charisma ever fully eclipse a life lived on the edge of morality? Hold on tight, because as shocking as Sinatra's story may be, it's just one piece of a much larger puzzle. Up next, we delve into the Rat Pack's own connections to the mob, and trust us, you won't want to miss it. In the glitzy world of Hollywood, where stars are born and legends are made, not everyone gets a happy ending. Such was the case for Johnny Stompanato, a handsome but ill-fated figure whose life was cut short under mysterious circumstances. Stompanato, a bodyguard and enforcer for the infamous gangster Mickey Cohen, was also known for his tumultuous relationship with actress Lana Turner. Their love affair was the talk of the town, but it would ultimately lead to a tragic and shocking conclusion. On the night of April 4, 1958, Stompanato was found dead in Lana Turner's Beverly Hills home, stabbed in the abdomen. The official story was that he had been killed by Turner's 14-year-old daughter, Cheryl Crane, in an attempt to protect her mother from Stompanato's violent outbursts. The case was quickly closed, ruled as justifiable homicide, but questions lingered. Was it really a simple case of self-defense, or was there more to the story? Stompanato was no stranger to the darker aspects of life. His association with Mickey Cohen gave him access to the seedy underbelly of Hollywood, a world where crime and glamour often went hand in hand. He was known to be possessive and volatile, traits that made his relationship with Lana Turner a ticking time bomb. But could a man with such dangerous connections really be taken down by a teenager? As investigators dug deeper, they uncovered a web of intrigue that extended far beyond a troubled love affair. Stompanato had made enemies, both in the criminal world and in Hollywood. His death could have been the result of a mob hit, a jealous lover, or even a cover-up orchestrated by the studios to protect Lana Turner's reputation. Each theory had its merits, but none could be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. The mystery of Johnny Stompanato's death remains unsolved to this day, a haunting reminder of the blurred lines between fame and infamy, love and obsession, truth and deception. It's a story that encapsulates the complex relationship between Hollywood and the mob, a relationship built on secrets, lies, and the ever-present allure of the spotlight. But as we delve into this tale of love gone wrong and lives cut short, we must also introduce another key player in Hollywood's hidden history, the Fixers. These are the men and women tasked with cleaning up the industry's messes, and their role is as crucial as it is controversial. In a world where image is everything, Hollywood has always had its fair share of scandals. From affairs and addictions to criminal activities, the lives of celebrities are often as dramatic off-screen as they are on-screen. But have you ever wondered how some of these scandals seem to vanish into thin air, leaving no trace behind? The answer lies in the shadowy figures known as Hollywood fixers. These fixers are the unsung heroes, or perhaps more fittingly, the unseen puppet masters of the entertainment industry. They are the crisis managers, the spin doctors, the ones who make problems go away, often before the public even catches a whiff of them. 
And more often than not, these fixers have connections to organized crime, making them the crucial link between the mob and Hollywood. One of the most famous fixers was Eddie Mannix, a man whose name is synonymous with the golden age of Hollywood. Mannix was a studio executive at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, but his real job was much more clandestine. He was the go-to guy for handling the studio's dirty laundry, from hushing up affairs and abortions to dealing with drunk driving incidents and drug addictions. Mannix was so effective at his job that he earned the nickname The Fixer, and his methods were anything but orthodox. He had contacts within the police force, the media, and yes, the mob making him a formidable force in the Hollywood landscape. But Mannix wasn't the only one. There were others like him, each serving different studios and celebrities, each with their own set of skills and contacts. These fixers operated in the background, invisible yet omnipresent, ensuring that the show could go on no matter what. However, the role of a fixer wasn't just about damage control. It was also about control, period. By handling the personal crises of stars and studio executives, fixers gained immense power and influence, often wielding it to further their own interests or those of their mob associates. It was a symbiotic relationship, one that allowed both parties to thrive in a system built on secrets and lies. As we peel back the layers of Hollywood's glamorous facade, we're confronted with a sobering reality. The industry we adore is far from perfect, and the people who keep it running are not always the heroes we imagine them to be. Next, we have a shocking revelation about a beloved actress that will make you question everything you thought you knew about Hollywood's golden era. Trust us, you won't want to miss this. Marilyn Monroe, the epitome of Hollywood glamour, remains an enigmatic figure even decades after her untimely death. Known for her beauty and vulnerability, Monroe captivated audiences worldwide. But behind the blonde bombshell persona was a woman entangled in a web of complexities, including alleged ties to organized crime. Monroe's connections to the mob have been a subject of speculation for years, fueled by her relationships with some of the most powerful men of her time. One such relationship was with Frank Sinatra, a man whose own mob ties we've already explored. Sinatra introduced Monroe to Sam Giancana, the notorious Chicago mobster. This wasn't a casual introduction. Monroe and Giancana were seen together on multiple occasions, leading many to wonder about the nature of their relationship. But it wasn't just Sinatra and Giancana. Monroe was also linked to the Rat Pack, a group known for their mob connections. She was a frequent guest at their Las Vegas performances and private parties, further intertwining her life with figures from the criminal underworld. Then there's the mystery surrounding her death. Officially ruled as a suicide, Monroe's passing has been shrouded in conspiracy theories, many of which involve the mob. Some believe that she was silenced to prevent her from revealing sensitive information about her high-profile relationships, including her alleged affairs with John F. Kennedy and Robert F. Kennedy. Given that both the Kennedys and the mob were fighting for control over various aspects of American society, Monroe could have been caught in a dangerous crossfire. As we delve deeper into Monroe's life, we're left with more questions than answers. Was she merely a pawn in a larger game of power and control? Or did she willingly engage with figures from the mob, fully aware of the risks involved? The answers are elusive, adding another layer of mystery to an already enigmatic life. As we ponder these questions, it's crucial to consider the broader context. Monroe was not an isolated case. She was part of a larger system that allowed, and perhaps even encouraged, such connections to flourish. Up next, we'll explore how the mob infiltrated one of the most powerful institutions in Hollywood, labor unions. And trust us, this is a chapter you won't want to skip. The glitz and glamour of Hollywood often overshadow the gritty realities that power the industry. One such reality is the influence of organized crime on Hollywood labor unions. These unions, responsible for representing the interests of writers, actors, and crew members, are a cornerstone of the entertainment world. However, their history is marred by corruption and mob influence, casting a shadow over the industry they serve. In the mid-20th century, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, one of Hollywood's most powerful unions, 
came under scrutiny for its alleged ties to organized crime, Willie Bioff, an influential figure within the IATSE, was exposed as a mob associate, leading to a scandal that rocked Hollywood to its core. Bioff was eventually convicted of extortion, but the damage was done. The revelation exposed the extent to which the mob had infiltrated Hollywood, raising questions about the integrity of the entire industry. But the IATSE wasn't the only union under the mob's influence. The Teamsters, another powerful union representing truck drivers and other logistical workers in Hollywood, also had its share of controversies. Led by Jimmy Hoffa, a man with well-known connections to organized crime, the Teamsters were implicated in various illegal activities, from money laundering to racketeering. Hoffa's mysterious disappearance in 1975 only added fuel to the fire, leaving many to speculate about the mob's role in his fate. So why did the mob target Hollywood unions? The answer is simple, control. By infiltrating these organizations, organized crime syndicates gained access to a massive workforce and, by extension, the entire Hollywood production process. This influence allowed them to manipulate labor disputes, secure favorable contracts, and even dictate the success or failure of certain films. It was a level of power that went far beyond mere financial gain, affecting the very fabric of American culture. Stay tuned, because up next, we're diving into the making of The Godfather, a film that not only portrayed the mob, but was also influenced by it. You won't believe how deep these connections go. When it comes to cinematic portrayals of the mob, few films hold a candle to The Godfather. Directed by Francis Ford Coppola and based on the novel by Mario Puzo, this epic saga delves into the lives of the Corleone family, offering a nuanced portrayal of organized crime. But what many may not know is that the making of The Godfather was as fraught with drama as the story it told. And yes, the mob was involved. From the outset, the Godfather faced numerous challenges, not least of which was the mob's initial opposition to the film. Concerned that the movie would portray them in a negative light, organized crime figures made their displeasure known, going so far as to threaten the production team and sabotage the film's sets. However, after a series of negotiations, some of which involved key mob figures, the opposition was quelled and the film received the blessing it needed to proceed. But the mob's involvement didn't end there. Throughout the production, the filmmakers had to navigate a minefield of sensitivities and demands. For instance, it's been reported that real-life mobsters were consulted to ensure the film's authenticity, from the accuracy of the dialogue to the depiction of mob rituals and customs. Some even claim that members of organized crime were present on set, overseeing the production to ensure it met their standards. The result was a film that not only captivated audiences, but also received the mob's stamp of approval. The Godfather went on to become one of the most successful films of all time, winning numerous awards and solidifying its place in cinematic history. But its success also raises ethical questions. At what cost did this masterpiece come to be? And how does the mob's involvement affect our perception of the film and, by extension, organized crime itself? As we reflect on the making of The Godfather, we're reminded once again of the complex relationship between Hollywood and the mob, a relationship that extends even to our most cherished cultural products. And as we prepare to delve into our next chapter, we'll explore another facet of this relationship that is often overlooked but equally important, the alleged laundering of mob money through Hollywood films. Up next, we'll look at cases where the mob's financial influence reached into the very heart of Hollywood, affecting not just the stories we see on screen, but also the economics of the industry itself. Trust us, this is a chapter you won't want to miss. The allure of Hollywood isn't just its storytelling magic, it's also a multi-billion dollar industry that churns out profits year after year. But where there's money, there's often a darker side, and in Hollywood's case, that includes allegations of money laundering through film productions. Yes, you heard that right. Some of the movies we know and love may have been financed, at least in part, by organized crime. Money laundering in Hollywood is not a new phenomenon. As far back as the golden age of cinema, there have been whispers about mob money being funneled into film productions. 
The process is relatively straightforward. Organized crime syndicates invest in a movie, either directly or through shell companies, effectively cleaning their ill-gotten gains by funneling them through a legitimate business. One of the most infamous examples is the 1980 film Heaven's Gate, a notorious box office flop that went massively over budget. While the film's financial failure is well documented, what's less known is the speculation about where some of that money came from. Rumors have swirled for years that Heaven's Gate was partially financed by mob money, although concrete evidence remains elusive. But it's not just historical examples. Allegations persist to this day. Independent films, with their lower budgets and less oversight, are particularly vulnerable. These smaller productions can serve as perfect vehicles for money laundering, allowing organized crime to invest in a film with little scrutiny, all while reaping the benefits if it turns out to be a hit. As we delve into this murky world, we're forced to confront uncomfortable questions about the ethics of entertainment. Can we truly enjoy a film knowing that its existence may be funded by criminal activity? And what does this say about the industry at large, which despite its glittering facade, remains susceptible to the corrupting influence of organized crime? As we wrap up this section, we're left pondering the intricate web of connections that link Hollywood to the mob, a web that extends far beyond the screen and into the very foundations of the entertainment industry. Up next, we'll discuss how the mob's influence persists in modern Hollywood and why understanding this connection is more crucial than ever. As we've journeyed through the labyrinthine connections between Hollywood and organized crime, one thing becomes abundantly clear. The mob's influence is not a relic of the past, but an ongoing reality. Even in today's age of digital streaming and corporate mega-studios, the tendrils of organized crime continue to weave through the fabric of the entertainment industry. Today's mob has adapted to the times, employing more sophisticated methods to exert influence. While the days of overt extortion and racketeering may be largely behind us, organized crime has found new avenues to infiltrate Hollywood. These can range from complex financial schemes to strategic partnerships with industry insiders, all designed to maintain a foothold in this lucrative sector. One modern example is the rise of offshore financing for film productions. With the globalization of the film industry, money flows across borders more freely than ever, providing ample opportunities for money laundering and other illicit activities. Organized crime syndicates can exploit these international financial networks to invest in Hollywood productions discreetly, often through a maze of shell companies and intermediaries. But it's not just about money, it's also about influence. The mob's connections can extend to talent agencies, distribution companies, and even regulatory bodies. By maintaining relationships with key industry players, organized crime can subtly shape the narratives that reach our screens, reinforcing their own agendas and worldviews. You know, in the world of Hollywood, there are stars, and then there are superstars. But every once in a while, there comes a personality so iconic so radiant that they don't just light up the screen, they become a cultural phenomenon. And if you were around in the 70s, you'd know there was one name and one hairstyle that was absolutely everywhere, Farrah Fawcett. But who was the woman behind those golden locks and that dazzling smile? Let's dive in, golden locks and a dazzling start. Born on February 2nd, 1947 in Corpus Christi, Texas, Farrah Lenny Fawcett was destined for the spotlight from a young age. With a name inspired by her mother Pauline's favorite actress, Madeline Carroll, Farrah was the younger of two daughters in the Fawcett household. Now, Texas might be known for its big hats, big boots, and even bigger personalities, but young Farrah was about to make it known for something else, big dreams. Growing up, Farrah attended John J. Pershing Middle School, where she was not just another face in the crowd, with her striking looks and undeniable charm, she was voted most beautiful by her classmates every single year. Talk about consistency. But high school wasn't just about accolades for Farah. it was at the University of Texas in Austin, where she began her foray into acting. And while she started with a major in microbiology, yes, you heard that right, she soon switched to art with a focus on sculpture. But as fate would have it, the world of microbes' loss was Hollywood's gain. In the mid-60s, Hollywood was a land of opportunity, and for a young, ambitious Farrah, it was the place to be. 
So with dreams as big as her home state, she packed her bags and headed to the City of Angels. But, as any aspiring actor would tell you, Hollywood isn't all glitz and glamour, it's a tough nut to crack. However, Farrah wasn't just any aspiring actor. With her radiant beauty and undeniable charisma, she quickly caught the eye of casting agents, starting with a string of commercials including a certain ad for a shaving cream that had everyone talking. Farrah's journey to stardom had officially begun, but commercials were just the beginning. With her foot in the door, Farrah began landing roles in TV shows. From guest appearances in shows like I Dream of Jeannie, to more substantial roles in series like Harry O, Farrah was making waves. And while these roles were a testament to her talent, the best was yet to come. Little did she know, a particular role was just around the corner, one that would not only change her life, but also define an era. As the 70s approached, Farrah's star was on the rise. But before she became the household name we all know and love, she had her fair share of struggles and moments of doubt. Yet with determination, talent and that iconic hair, Farrah Fawcett was about to take Hollywood by storm. And the world? Well, the world was eagerly waiting, from commercials to stardom. So, you've made it to Hollywood, you've got the looks, the charm and a few commercials under your belt, but how do you go from being that girl from the shaving cream ad to a bona fide star? Well, if you're Farrah Fawcett, you do it with style, grace, and a sprinkle of that signature Farrah magic. As the 1970s dawned, Hollywood was in the midst of a transformation. The old studio system was fading, and a new era of television and film was emerging. And right in the middle of it all was our Texan beauty, Farrah. While her early roles in shows and commercials had given her a taste of the limelight, it was clear that she was destined for bigger things. And Hollywood, well, it was starting to take notice. Enter the world of TV series. Now, for many actors, landing a role in a TV series can be a game-changer. It's consistent work, a regular paycheck, and if the show's a hit, instant stardom. And for Farrah, this golden opportunity came in the form of a little show called, wait for it, Charlie's Angels. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Before the Angels, Farrah had a series of roles that showcased her range as an actress, from the sci-fi series Logan's Run to the detective drama Harry O. She was proving that she was more than just a pretty face. But while these roles were stepping stones, the real turning point came when she met TV producers Aaron Spelling and Leonard Goldberg. The duo had an idea for a show about three female detectives who worked for a mysterious benefactor named Charlie, and they believed Farrah was perfect for one of the lead roles. But here's the twist. Farrah wasn't the first choice for the role of Jill Monroe. In fact, the part was initially offered to another actress who turned it down. Talk about fate. With her golden locks, athletic build, and undeniable screen presence, Farrah breathed life into Jill Monroe, making her one of the most memorable characters on the show. Charlie's Angels premiered in 1976, and to say it was a hit would be an understatement. The show was a cultural phenomenon, and Farrah, along with her co-stars Kate Jackson and Jacqueline Smith, became overnight sensations. They were everywhere, from magazine covers to talk shows and, yes, even on lunchboxes. The Angels were the talk of the town, and Farrah was leading the charge. But with great fame comes great challenges. As the show's popularity soared, so did the demands on its stars. And for Farrah, who had always valued her independence, the intense scrutiny and pressure began to take a toll. But if there's one thing we've learned about Farrah Fawcett, it's that she's full of surprises. And as the world watched, she was about to make a move that no one saw coming. Charlie's angel takes flight. Ah, the 70s. A time of disco, bell-bottoms, and a trio of crime-fighting women who took the world by storm. Charlie's Angels wasn't just a show, it was a revolution. And at the heart of this revolution was our very own Farrah, soaring higher than ever. Now every show has its standout character, and for Charlie's Angels, Jill Monroe, played by Farrah, was that character. With her athletic prowess, fearless attitude, and that iconic hair flip, Jill became an instant favorite. But what made Farrah's portrayal so special? It wasn't just the action sequences or the glamorous undercover missions. It was the depth and authenticity she brought to the role. Jill Monroe wasn't just an angel. She was a symbol of empowerment for women everywhere. The show's premise was simple. Three former police officers turned private detectives, 
working for the enigmatic Charlie Townsend. But instead of the usual gruff male detectives of the time, these were women who were smart, skilled, and could throw a punch or two when needed. And leading the pack was Jill, the adventurous and free-spirited angel. But here's the thing about shooting stars, they burn bright but they also burn fast. And after just one season, in a move that shocked fans and industry insiders alike, Farrah decided to leave. Charlie's Angels. Why you ask? Well, it wasn't due to any onset drama or disputes. Farrah had always been an artist at heart, and she felt the need to explore roles that challenged her as an actress. But leaving such a successful show was a gamble. Hollywood can be unforgiving, and there was no guarantee of success outside the protective wings of the Angels. Yet Farrah's departure from the show wasn't the end. It was a new beginning. While she did make guest appearances in subsequent seasons, her focus shifted to films and other challenging roles. From drama to comedy, from stage to screen, Farrah was on a mission to prove her versatility as an actress. And as the world watched her take on new roles and challenges, one thing became clear. Farrah Fawcett wasn't just an angel. She was a force to be reckoned with. A force that was about to take Hollywood on a journey beyond the halo of Charlie's Angels. Beyond the halo. In the vast universe of Hollywood, stars come and go. But then there are those who, once they shine, never really fade away. Farrah Fawcett was one such star. Having soared to dizzying heights with Charlie's Angels, she was now on a quest to explore new horizons and prove that she was more than just Jill Monroe. The late 70s and early 80s were a transformative period for Farrah. While many expected her to stick to glamorous roles, she had other plans. She took on projects that were not just diverse but also challenging. From the sci-fi thriller Saturn Three Inches to the gripping drama Extremities, Farrah was pushing boundaries and showcasing her range as an actress. One role in particular stood out and showcased her depth. The TV movie The Burning Bed Based on a true story, Farrah played Francine Hughes, a woman subjected to years of domestic abuse who takes a drastic step to protect herself and her children. The role was raw, intense, and a far cry from the glamorous world of Charlie's Angels. Farrah's portrayal was both heart-wrenching and powerful, earning her the first of multiple Emmy nominations. It was clear to everyone, Farrah Fawcett was not just a pretty face. She was a formidable actress, but it wasn't just drama that Farrah excelled in. She showcased her comedic chops in films like Man of the House and Dr. T and The Women. Whether it was making audiences laugh or moving them to tears, Farrah had the rare ability to connect with viewers on a deeply emotional level. And while her professional journey was filled with highs and lows, Farrah remained grounded. She never lost sight of who she was, a talented artist, a loving mother, and a woman with an indomitable spirit. Hollywood can be a tough place, with its fair share of challenges and pitfalls, but through it all, Farrah navigated her path with grace, determination, and an unwavering commitment to her craft. As the 80s gave way to the 90s and the new millennium, Farrah continued to work, taking on roles that resonated with her. She also ventured into producing, ensuring that stories she believed in saw the light of day. And through it all, one thing remained constant, her passion for acting, and her love for her fans. But as with all journeys, there are twists and turns, and Farrah's journey was no exception. As she moved beyond the halo of her early fame, she was about to face challenges that would test her in ways she could never have imagined. The poster that graced a million walls. Ah, the 1970s. A time of disco balls, roller skates, and posters. Yes, posters, and not just any posters. We're talking about the poster the one that became an emblem of a generation, the one that adorned the walls of countless bedrooms, dorm rooms and garages, the one that featured Farrah Fawcett in a red swimsuit, her radiant smile beaming and those golden locks cascading perfectly. It's an image that, once seen, is never forgotten. Now every icon has its origin story and this poster is no exception. The year was 1976. Farrah was already making waves with Charlie's Angels but little did she know that a simple photo shoot would catapult her to even greater fame. The shoot was casual, with Farah doing her own hair and makeup. The chosen outfit, a red one-piece swimsuit that Farah had picked up on a whim. The setting was outdoors, with the sun providing the perfect natural lighting, and the result? Pure magic. 
Photographer Bruce McBroom captured the shot, and the rest, as they say, is history. The image was natural, unretouched, and showcased Farah's genuine charm. It was a departure from the overly glamorized and staged photos of the time, and that's what made it special. It wasn't just a picture of a beautiful woman. It was a snapshot of a moment, a feeling, an era. The poster was released by Pro Arts Inc., and it became an instant sensation. Selling over 12 million copies, it set records and became one of the best-selling posters of all time. Fans couldn't get enough of it, and it wasn't just the guys. Women admired Farah's effortless beauty and confidence. The poster became a symbol of the 70s, capturing the spirit of the times. But what was it about this poster that resonated with so many? Was it the carefree pose, the genuine smile, the iconic hairstyle? Perhaps it was a combination of all these elements, but more than anything, it was Farah herself. She represented a new kind of celebrity, approachable, relatable, and real. While the poster added to Farah's fame, it also came with its challenges. Being an icon means being in the spotlight, and Farah often found herself at the center of attention, both wanted and unwanted. But through it all, she handled it with grace, always staying true to herself. As the years went by, the poster remained a cultural touchstone. It was referenced in movies, TV shows, and pop culture, cementing its place in history. And while Farah went on to achieve many more accolades in her career, the poster remained one of her most enduring legacies. But beyond the glitz and glamour, beyond the fame and the records, the poster tells a deeper story. It's a story of a young woman from Texas who took Hollywood by storm, not just with her beauty, but with her talent, determination, and heart, love, heartbreak, and resilience. In the grand tapestry of life, love plays a central role. It has the power to uplift, to shatter, and to heal. And for Farrah Fawcett, love was a constant companion on her journey, bringing with it moments of sheer joy, profound heartbreak, and ultimately, resilience. Enter Lee Majors, the dashing star of the Six Million Dollar Man. The two met in the early 70s and were instantly smitten. Hollywood had seen its fair share of power couples, but Farrah and Lee were in a league of their own. Dubbed the Golden Couple, their romance was the stuff of fairy tales. In 1973, amidst a whirlwind of media attention, they tied the knot, becoming Mr. and Mrs. Majors. But as anyone who's been in the limelight will tell you, fame comes with its challenges. And for Farrah and Lee, the constant scrutiny and pressure began to take a toll on their relationship. With both their careers skyrocketing, they often found themselves pulled in different directions. The time apart, the rumors, the relentless media attention, it all added up. And in 1982, after nearly a decade together, the golden couple decided to part ways. Heartbreak, as they say, is the price of love. But for Farah, it was also an opportunity for growth and self-discovery. She threw herself into her work, taking on roles that challenged and inspired her. But love, being the unpredictable force that it is, had other plans. Enter Ryan O'Neill, the charismatic actor known for his roles in Love Story and Paper Moon. Farah and Ryan's paths had crossed several times over the years, but it was only after her split from Lee that sparks truly flew. Their relationship was passionate, tumultuous, and deeply committed. Through ups and downs, joys and sorrows, Farah and Ryan stood by each other, their bond growing stronger with each passing year. But love, as Farah would come to learn, is not just about romantic partners, it's also about family. In 1985, Farah and Ryan welcomed their son, Redmond O'Neill, into the world. For Farah, motherhood was a transformative experience, bringing with it a new sense of purpose and joy. Through the years, Farah faced her fair share of challenges, both personal and professional. But through it all, love remained her anchor. Whether it was the love of her partners, the love of her son, or the love of her fans, it was this love that gave her the strength to face adversity head-on and emerge stronger on the other side. As the 90s rolled around, Farah continued to shine, both on and off the screen. But as she was about to discover, life had a few more twists in store for her. And as always, love would play a central role, breaking the mold. In the vast landscape of Hollywood, where typecasting is the norm, breaking out of a set image can be a Herculean task. But if there's one thing Farrah Fawcett proved time and again, 
It's that she was no ordinary star. She was a trailblazer, constantly pushing boundaries and defying expectations. After her iconic stint as Jill Monroe in Charlie's Angels, many expected Farrah to remain in the realm of glamorous roles, but she had other plans. Farrah was on a quest, a quest to showcase her versatility as an actress and to challenge the preconceived notions that came with her image. One of her most notable roles during this period was in the off-Broadway play Extremities. Farrah played the role of Marjorie, a woman who turns the tables on her would-be rapist. It was a raw, intense, and challenging role, miles away from the glitz of Charlie's Angels. Farrah's portrayal was both powerful and vulnerable, earning her critical acclaim and proving that she was a force to be reckoned with on stage as well. But Farrah's desire to break the mold wasn't limited to her roles. She also ventured into the world of production. In an industry dominated by men, Farrah co-founded her own production company, Fawcett Majors Productions, with then-husband Lee Majors. The company produced a series of successful projects, further cementing Farrah's status as a multi-talented powerhouse. Throughout the 80s and 90s, Farrah continued to take on roles that challenged her as an actress. From the heart-wrenching portrayal of a mother fighting for custody of her children in See You in the Morning, to the gritty role of a detective in Small Sacrifices, Farrah showcased her range and depth with each performance. But it wasn't just her roles that set Farrah apart, it was her approach to her craft. She was known for her meticulous preparation, often going to great lengths to get into the skin of her characters. Whether it was spending time with real-life detectives to prepare for a role or undergoing physical transformations, Farrah left no stone unturned in her pursuit of authenticity. As the new millennium dawned, Farrah continued to shine, both in front of and behind the camera. She produced and starred in the reality series Chasing Farrah, giving fans a glimpse into her life off-screen. And while she faced her fair share of challenges, both personal and professional, Farrah's spirit remained unbroken. She was a fighter, always pushing forward, always breaking the mold. A battle off-screen, while the world watched Farrah Fawcett light up screens with her talent and charisma, behind the scenes, she was gearing up for a battle of a different kind. A battle that would require all her strength, resilience, and indomitable spirit. In 2006, Farrah was diagnosed with anal cancer. For many, such a diagnosis would be a crushing blow. But Farrah, ever the fighter, faced it head on. She was determined to beat the odds and embarked on a rigorous treatment regimen. Throughout her journey, she remained open about her struggles, hoping to raise awareness and inspire others facing similar challenges. But this wasn't just a personal battle for Farah. She decided to document her journey, giving an intimate look into the realities of living with cancer. The result was Farah's Story, a two-hour documentary that aired in 2009. The film was raw, unfiltered, and deeply moving. It showcased Farah's vulnerability, her strength, and her unwavering determination to fight the disease. Farrah's story resonated with millions around the world. It shed light on the harsh realities of cancer treatment, the pain, the side effects, the emotional toll. But more than that, it was a testament to Farrah's spirit. Even in her weakest moments, her resilience shone through. The documentary was a reminder that behind the glamorous facade, Farrah was a real person, facing real challenges, just like anyone else. Throughout her battle, Farah was surrounded by loved ones who provided unwavering support. Her longtime partner, Ryan O'Neill, was by her side every step of the way, offering comfort and strength. Their bond, which had weathered many storms over the years, grew even stronger in the face of adversity. Sadly, on June 25, 2009, Farah Fawcett lost her battle with cancer, but while her physical presence may have been taken away, her spirit remained undiminished. She left behind a legacy of courage, determination, and hope. A legacy that continues to inspire millions around the world. In the wake of her passing, tributes poured in from all corners. Fans, friends, and fellow celebrities shared their memories of Farah, celebrating her life and her impact. She was remembered not just as a talented actress, but as a beacon of strength and resilience. Legacy of an angel. In the annals of Hollywood history, many stars shine bright, but few leave an indelible mark that transcends generations. Farrah Fawcett is undeniably one of those luminous few. Her legacy is not just defined by her iconic roles or her glamorous image, 
but by the profound impact she had on culture, society and the countless lives she touched. Farah's iconic feathered hairstyle became a sensation in the 70s, setting a trend that millions emulated. It wasn't just a hairstyle, it was a symbol of the era's free spirit and a testament to Farah's influence. But beyond the hair and the dazzling smile, Farah was a trendsetter in more profound ways. She used her platform to advocate for causes close to her heart, from cancer awareness to women's rights. Her documentary, Farah's Story, was not just a personal chronicle but a beacon of hope for many battling cancer. It demystified the disease, humanized the struggle, and inspired countless individuals to face their challenges with courage and grace. The documentary earned her a posthumous Emmy nomination, a testament to its profound impact. But Farah's influence wasn't limited to the screen. She was an ardent supporter of various charitable causes. The Farah Fawcett Foundation, established in 2007, is a testament to her commitment to making a difference. The foundation supports cancer research, patient assistance, and prevention efforts, ensuring that Farah's legacy of giving continues to touch lives. In the world of entertainment, Farah's legacy is equally profound. She paved the way for future actresses, proving that one could be both a symbol and a serious actor. Her roles, diverse and challenging, broke stereotypes and set new standards. From the glamorous Jill Munro in Charlie's Angels to the gritty portrayal in The Burning Bed, Farah showcased her range and depth, earning respect and admiration from peers and fans alike. Her legacy also lives on in the memories of those who knew her. Friends, co-stars and loved ones often speak of her warmth, kindness and infectious spirit. She was a beacon of positivity, always ready with a smile, a kind word or a helping hand. In the years since her passing, Farah's influence continues to resonate. Tributes, documentaries and retrospectives celebrate her life and legacy, ensuring that her spirit lives on. From fashion to advocacy, from entertainment to philanthropy, Farah Fawcett's legacy is vast, varied and enduring. In the history of Hollywood, most famous actors and actresses stood out either because of their beauty or immense talent. But every once in a while, an actress comes along to wow the industry in ways no one else has. Jane Mansfield was one of those actresses, and besides her incredible talent, she understood how to promote herself and personal brand, even through unconventional ways that have set the pace for those after her. But to delve in, we must start from the beginning. Let's start from the beginning. Birth of a Star a small-town girl with big dreams born on April 19, 1933, in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. Her name? Jane Mansfield. But make no mistake, she wasn't just any girl. She was destined for the bright lights of Hollywood. Even in her early years, her captivating beauty and charisma set her apart from the rest. Jane's journey began in the heart of America, where she honed her talents as a student at the University of Texas, Little did she know that these humble beginnings would be the foundation for a career that would astound the world. She was like a sparkling diamond waiting to be discovered. As the 1950s dawned, Jane's heart was set on Hollywood. She knew the path to stardom was not paved with roses, but she was determined to make her mark. With a one-way ticket to Hollywood and a heart full of dreams, she set off on her adventure. Hollywood was a place of dreams and dreamers, but Jane was no ordinary dreamer. Her ambition was boundless, and she was willing to take risks. She didn't wait for the world to notice her. Instead, she made the world take notice. Soon she was on the silver screen, as sure enough, her presence lit up all those who beheld her amazing talent. Audiences couldn't get enough of her, and Hollywood began to take notice. She wasn't just an actress. She was a force of nature, and her allure was magnetic. But there was more to Jane than met the eye. She had a knack for turning heads, not only with her acting, but also with her strategic marketing moves. She was a master of the unexpected, and the world soon realized that her life was the most captivating show in town. But no one knew for sure what she was trying to do. All they knew was that Jane was fascinating, and they couldn't get enough of her. This was enough foundation for Jane to take advantage and push herself in the faces of more people with incredibly strategic methods. The need to stand out 
Upon her arrival in Hollywood, Jane faced fierce competition. The city was teeming with aspiring actors and starlets, but she wasn't one to be discouraged. She understood the power of making a grand entrance, and this is where her genius marketing skills started to shine. Jane Mansfield quickly realized that she needed to stand out. She employed various tactics to capture the attention of casting directors and the media. It's here that her journey of creating headlines began. She made sure to be seen at all the right places, in all the right outfits, and with all the right people. She posed provocatively for the press, her vibrant blonde hair and hourglass figure becoming her signature. Publicity stunts were her bread and butter. She'd wear revealing outfits that pushed the boundaries of the time, and the media couldn't get enough of it. She posed nude for a Playboy photo shoot, which at the time was a bold and daring move. This created an enduring buzz around her and solidified her image as a bombshell, a title she fully embraced. But what truly set Jane apart was her keen understanding of the power of the media. She cultivated relationships with reporters and photographers, ensuring that she was a constant presence in the press. It wasn't just about talent, it was about building a brand, and Jane was the master of this craft. Her iconic image became a major marketing tool. Her statuesque figure, platinum blonde hair, and love for all things pink, especially her signature pink mansion, made her instantly recognizable. Jane knew that her image was her calling card and she played it to the hilt. It wasn't long before her unique image and calculated publicity stunts caught the attention of Hollywood's bigwigs. She appeared in films alongside notable actors and further cemented her status as a star. However, it was her calculated approach to self-promotion that truly showcased her marketing genius. Soon enough, her bold personal band began to make room for new opportunities outside of Hollywood. You see, Jane was smart, so she didn't limit herself to movies. She endorsed products and launched her own line of Jane Mansfield-inspired merchandise, from clothing to beauty products. She recognized the value of associating her name with everyday products, ensuring her brand was everywhere. But along with the products she endorsed, she promoted her personality, some ore. She knew she was the real moneymaker and not the product. So she went ahead and appeared on countless talk shows and radio programs, not missing an opportunity to put her name out there. Jane Mansfield knew the art of self-promotion like no other. Before long, a lot of relationship scandals regarding her as well as dirty scandals began to surface in the media. One would think this was the end for the genius actress, but unknown to the rest of the world, they were part of her elaborate marketing strategy. High-profile romances and controversies kept her in the headlines. Her marriages to well-known figures like Mickey Hargitay and her romantic escapades were a constant source of fascination. Her international appeal was undeniable. Again, refusing to be boxed into any corner, she began to take her brand outside the shots of the United States, a very daring and unusual move around time. She traveled the world, embraced different cultures, and solidified her image as a global icon. She was truly a marketing genius on an international scale. Jane's legacy and influence extended far beyond her lifetime. Her marketing strategies became a blueprint for countless future celebrities. She showed that it wasn't just talent that could make you a star, it was the way you marketed yourself. But as with any dramatic story, there's a bittersweet twist, but before then, Marketing is nothing if the public doesn't pick up what you're putting out, so what did people really think of Jane Mansfield? Public Perception Fans saw Jane as the embodiment of glamour and sensuality. Her iconic image as a blonde bombshell and her undeniable charisma won her a legion of dedicated admirers. To them, she was a symbol of allure and feminine power, but filmmakers had a different opinion about her. Directors and producers had mixed opinions of Jane Mansfield. While some saw her as a talented actress who brought a unique charisma to her roles, others considered her more of a publicity stunt than a true performer. Regardless, her uncanny ability to draw audiences and generate publicity made her a valuable asset in the entertainment industry. Brand owners and marketers adored her. 
Jane was a walking billboard and she knew it. She used her image and persona to endorse countless products and her collaborations with various brands were lucrative. Her association with these products only added to her allure as an iconic figure of the era. Friends and colleagues often spoke of Jane's intelligence and ambition behind the scenes. She was a woman who knew exactly what she was doing. One of her friends, fellow actress Mamie Van Doren, once said, Jane had a great sense of humor about herself. She knew how to manipulate the press and create an image. Underneath all the glamour and glitz, she was a smart businesswoman. Even Jane herself acknowledged the way she managed her public perception. She once said, if you're going to do something wrong, do it big, because the punishment is the same either way. I just happen to do it big. Jane's understanding of her public image was undeniable. She was both the mastermind and the subject of her narrative. She embraced the media's fascination with her and exploited it to her advantage. Her antics, whether on screen or off, were all part of the grand performance that was Jane Mansfield. Influence, Inspiration, Copycats During the height of her career in the 1950s and early 1960s, Jane Mansfield was no doubt a trailblazer in the art of self-promotion. Her understanding of the power of image and media was unparalleled, and this approach to fame would set a precedent for generations of celebrities to come. One notable celebrity influenced by Jane's marketing strategies was the iconic Marilyn Monroe. While Marilyn had already established herself as a Hollywood legend, she couldn't help but take a page from Jane's book when it came to self-promotion. Marilyn started using more provocative photo shoots and focused on crafting a distinct image akin to Jane's sultry bombshell persona. This shift in her marketing strategy brought renewed attention to her career, but Marilyn wasn't the only one. Another starlet who followed in Jane's footsteps was Anna Nicole Smith. With her voluptuous figure and alluring persona, Smith embraced Jane's idea that sensationalism sells. Like Mansfield, Smith's image became inextricably tied to her bold personality and unapologetic self-promotion. Shifting from vintage Hollywood and into the modern era, the likes of Kim Kardashian and Paris Hilton took cues from Jane Mansfield's marketing playbook. Both reality TV stars, they learned that being in the spotlight is about much more than just talent. It's about crafting a persona, maintaining an image, and utilizing the media to your advantage. Their business ventures, from fragrances to fashion lines, echo Jane's endorsements and product lines. The emergence of the influencer phenomenon can also be traced back to Jane Mansfield's groundbreaking work. She recognized the power of aligning herself with products, and today's social media influencers have taken this concept to the digital realm, showcasing and endorsing products to their followers. The idea of courting controversy and scandal as a marketing strategy, which Jane Mansfield was a master of, has been adopted by many contemporary celebrities. Pop stars like Madonna and Lady Gaga have incorporated shock value into their personas, daring to be different to gain attention, much like Jane did during her career. Jane's understanding of international appeal also impacted the way celebrities approached global recognition. Her world travels and engagements with diverse cultures showed that stardom could extend beyond national borders. This international approach has been embraced by countless celebrities looking to expand their reach. In essence, Jane Mansfield laid the groundwork for the concept of the celebrity as a brand. She understood that fame wasn't just about talent, but about creating a distinct image, leveraging the media, and becoming larger than life. Her legacy lives on in the way celebrities promote themselves and build their brands today. In the ever-evolving world of entertainment, the lessons learned from Jane Mansfield's marketing genius continue to shape the way celebrities navigate fame, self-promotion, and the enduring pursuit of the spotlight. Her influence remains proof of the enduring power of a well-crafted public persona and the indomitable spirit of those who dare to be different. Jane, the fashion icon. Jane Mansfield's impact on fashion trends was nothing short of extraordinary. 
Her distinctive style and collaborations with designers played a significant role in shaping the fashion of the era, particularly during the 1950s and 1960s. She knew that fashion was a powerful tool back then, and she was determined to use it to her advantage. Jane had an innate sense of fashion that was both glamorous and provocative. Her trademark look featured hourglass silhouettes, plunging necklines, and, of course, the color pink, which she adored. It was a style that defied convention and celebrated femininity, and it quickly caught the public's attention. One of the most notable ways Jane influenced fashion was through her affinity for form-fitting, curve-enhancing ensembles. She popularized the use of figure-hugging dresses, accentuating her voluptuous curves, and ultimately inspiring women to embrace their own bodies. She wasn't just a style icon, she was a symbol of body positivity at a time when the fashion industry was often focused on very slim figures. But ultimately, collaborations with designers were instrumental in her style evolution. Jane worked closely with couturiers like Oleg Cassini, who designed some of her most iconic gowns. These creations were not just dresses, they were works of art, adorned with sequins, rhinestones, and luxurious fabrics that emphasized her glamorous image. These collaborations showcased Jane's understanding of fashion as a means of self-expression and marketing. Pink became her signature color, and she famously owned a pink mansion. It wasn't just a personal preference, it was a branding strategy. Pink became synonymous with Jane Mansfield, and the color saw a resurgence in popularity during her time. Women began to associate it with femininity, luxury, and audaciousness, much like Jane herself. Her influence extended beyond the United States. In Europe, she was a sensation, and her bold fashion choices resonated with a new generation. Her impact can still be seen in European fashion today, with designers taking inspiration from her bold and unapologetic style. Jane's penchant for glitz and glamour, her fearless embrace of her own sensuality, and her strategic use of fashion as a marketing tool left an indelible mark on the fashion world. She defied conventions and showed the world that fashion was not just about clothing, but a means of self-expression, an art form, and a way to command attention. Charity Influencer While Jane Mansfield was primarily known for her glamorous and often provocative public image, not many people knew that she had a compassionate side that led her to be involved in several charitable endeavors during her lifetime. One of the causes close to Jane's heart was her work with the National Institute for Juvenile Diabetes Research. Her son, Zoltan Hargate, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at a young age, and this personal connection inspired her to become an advocate for diabetes research. She used her celebrity status to raise awareness about the disease and to support fundraising efforts. Her involvement in this cause demonstrated her maternal instincts and her commitment to making a positive impact on the lives of children and families affected by diabetes. In addition to her work with diabetes research, Jane was also associated with charitable organizations that aimed to improve the lives of underprivileged children. She often participated in charity events and fundraisers, using her star power to draw attention and raise funds for various children's causes. Her involvement with such organizations reflected her desire to give back to the community and make a difference in the lives of those less fortunate. Jane's philanthropic activities were not always in the spotlight as her public persona often overshadowed her charitable efforts. However, her involvement in these causes shed light on her compassionate side and her willingness to use her fame for the greater good. It showcased her sense of responsibility to contribute positively to society and help those in need. In a world that often focused on her glamorous image and sensational headlines, Jane Mansfield's philanthropic work serves as a reminder that behind the public persona was a woman with a genuine desire to make the world a better place, one charitable act at a time. Her contributions to various causes continue to inspire the notion that compassion and empathy can coexist with fame and fortune. Now, aside Jane being a force to recon with and being on the news headlines, this marketing genius also had a beautiful personal life, and it's astounding how she tried to balance it all. Jane, the mother.
Beyond the dazzling lights of Hollywood and the marketing genius that defined her career, Jane Mansfield was, at her core, a devoted mother. She may not have looked like a conventional mother, but she certainly was a loving mom to her kids. The story of her motherhood unfolds as a significant chapter in her life, offering a unique perspective on the woman behind the glamour. As a mother to five children, Jane embraced her maternal role with a warmth and affection that contrasted her public persona. Her friends often remarked on her nurturing nature, a side of her rarely seen amidst the flashbulbs and headlines. Balancing the demands of a thriving career in the entertainment industry with the responsibilities of motherhood was no small feat. Yet, Jane managed this tightrope act with remarkable resolve. She often made her work a family affair, bringing her children to film sets and red carpets. Her dedication to both her career and her children serves as a testament to her determination and resilience. The challenges of public life added complexity to her role as a mother. Jane's children were thrust into the media's spotlight by mere virtue of being hers, shielding them from the often harsh scrutiny of the press while maintaining her glamorous image was a delicate balancing act she faced. Beyond her image, Jane's family dynamics were marked by the ebb and flow of high-profile marriages and divorces. Her relationships with her children, her husbands, and her extended family revealed the personal struggles she navigated. Being a mother likely entailed significant personal sacrifices, but Jane's unwavering commitment to provide for her children while pursuing her career suggests the toll this balancing act took on her personal life. Fan Clubs for one to be regarded as a celebrity, you must have adoring fans and know how to maintain them as well as keep them happy. Jane Mansfield knew this all too well, and she developed a unique ability to engage with her fans, which played a pivotal role in her enduring popularity as a marketing genius. She understood the value of fan engagement in an era where the concept of a personal relationship between a celebrity and their admirers was a relatively novel idea. Maintaining active fan clubs was one of Jane's most significant steps in cultivating her dedicated fan base. These clubs became a hub for her admirers, offering exclusive access to her world and creating a sense of belonging among her fans. Through newsletters and membership perks, she kept her supporters informed and involved in her life and career. What truly set Jane apart was her personal touch with her fans. She didn't just passively acknowledge their presence, she actively corresponded with them. She read their letters, responded with personal notes, and often included autographed photos. This level of interaction was unprecedented in the entertainment industry at the time and created a deep and genuine connection between her and her fans. Jane's fan engagement extended to meet and greet events where she would spend time with her fans, take photos, and chat with them. She understood that her admirers weren't just an audience, they were her loyal following, and she treated them with warmth and gratitude. This personal engagement was not just a marketing ploy, it was a reflection of her authentic appreciation for the people who supported her. Jane recognized that her fans were the cornerstone of her success, and she reciprocated their loyalty with genuine affection and respect. The result of Jane Mansfield's fan engagement efforts was a fan base that felt genuinely connected to her. Her fans weren't just passive spectators of her life, they were active participants. Today, fan engagement is a fundamental aspect of celebrity branding and marketing. Jane Mansfield's early understanding of its value and her groundbreaking approach to building a strong and lasting bond with her fans set a precedent for future celebrities. Her legacy as a marketing genius is not just about her image, but also about the deep and lasting relationships she fostered with her admirers, proving that personal engagement with fans is a timeless and invaluable strategy in the world of fame and celebrity. Everything seemed to be going great for Jane, but sadly, fate has a twisted plan for her, one that the world did not see coming. Tragic End at the age of 34, on June 29, 1967, in a car accident on a Louisiana highway, sent shockwaves through Hollywood and forever altered her legacy. No one thought she would die at such a young age because she was so bright and energetic. 
Jane's death was a poignant reminder of the ephemeral nature of fame and beauty. Her public image was that of an invincible glamour icon, yet her tragic demise served as a stark contrast to this image. The circumstances surrounding her death were heart-wrenching. She was in the prime of her career and had a promising future ahead of her. The accident also claimed the lives of her boyfriend, Sam Brody, and their driver, Ronnie Harrison, further compounding the tragedy. The devastating loss of these lives left an indelible impact on her family, friends, and fans. In the wake of her death, Jane Mansfield's legacy underwent a transformation. She was no longer a living, breathing figure of the silver screen. She became an enduring symbol of the perils of fame. The media coverage of her accident served as a reminder that even the brightest stars could be extinguished in an instant. Jane's legacy, previously dominated by her marketing genius and iconic image, now also encompassed the tragedy of her untimely death. Her story became a tale in the entertainment industry, highlighting the price of fame and the importance of responsible behavior. This tragedy added depth to her legacy, transcending her image as a marketing genius and shedding light on the darker side of the fame she had achieved. The circumstances of her death prompted discussions about the dangers of reckless behavior and the need for heightened safety awareness in the entertainment industry. It also evoked a sense of nostalgia among her fans who mourned the loss of a beloved star and the era of glamour she represented. Despite the tragic circumstances of her end, Jane Mansfield's legacy endures. Her impact on marketing and self-promotion, her influence on the fashion and beauty industry, and her deep connection with her fans continue to inspire and influence the world of entertainment. Her life, though cut short, remains a testament to the complexities of fame and the enduring power of a well-crafted public persona.